It's just one of those things. Everything on the railroad had a nickname. Every tool, every place, every person. And it was one of the fun things about uh, working for the Green Mountain on the Ashley lot. Thank you for tuning in to High Green, the official podcast of the Boston and Maine Railroad Historical Society. High Green is funded by your membership in the society, and any opinions expressed throughout the show are solely those of the owner. As always, if you'd like to learn more about our organization or join us, you can find our website, www.bmrrhs.org. Perhaps this story hasn't been told in B&M circles, but it's, no. it's a B&M story and it's a good one. Oh my God, he says, I don't think I ever saw a train down here before. <laughs> he was amused. <laughs> I still have that wander lost. I still want to go back rowing. On tonight's episode of High Green, we're joined by Scott Whitney, who's going to be discussing with us a little bit about the Green Mountain Railroad's operations over the Boston and Maine's Ashwilet branch in the early 1980s. Scott's a longtime contributor to the society and former president, and he's authored quite a few articles for the, our uh, bulletin, namely um, an article titled From Ashwilet to Ashes, which was published in the September 1985 issue and covers the topics we're going to be discussing tonight. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Rick. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So usually we like to start out um, our interviews with a little bit of background uh, on our interviewees. All of us kind of have a different way of coming into the hobby and coming into the industry, but I think everybody kind of has a similar path. Uh, So if you could just kind of walk us through how you got interested in railroads and ultimately how did that lead to your employment with the Green Mountain Railroad? Getting interested in uh, railroads in general was a combination of factors. Uh, we attribute it first to the fact that uh, my parents had bought a playpen with an animal train printed on the bottom of it. So <laughs> I get to stare at that for hours at a time. Yeah. And my paternal grandmother on occasion would take me on uh, carriage walks at our house in Claremont, New Hampshire, was situated within view of two of the crossings of the Claremont and Concord Railroad. And some of these walks would be along the right of way, actually, mm-hmm. uh, to a trestle which was out over the Sugar River. I remember that as one of my first memories as a child. And of course, you know, occasionally a train would come along. And everything blossomed from there. Uh, Living so close to the railroad, I got to see it uh, on a regular basis, except when I was in school, because the, the CNC was uh, usually done by three o'clock. Mm-hmm. The school let out, they were done working and gone. Over the years, my interest kept growing. Uh, I didn't know too much about other railroads. An occasional journey to West Lebanon, New Hampshire, would take us to the J.W. Barber discount store of those places where they bought truckload lots of clothes out of items from other places. Mm-hmm. But their store had uh, three stories of space. It was a large old frame house. 
but the second floor had a wonderful view of the Westboro Engine House facilities. So my mother never had to worry about where I was. I, she, when she needed to find me, she'd go up, up to the second floor and she'd park the clothes rack that <laughs> uh, blocked the window. And she'd find me sitting on the windowsill looking <laughs> at all the operations at Westboro. And yeah. That was my introduction to the Boston and Maine. Sure. Good introduction to have. <laughs> Uh, it seems to have been kind of a uh, kind of a touchstone for a lot of people in that area up until it was closed, um, and I think a lot of people up and down the, the Connecticut River Valley have a similar memories of of the Claremont and Concord or the Springfield Terminal or the Central Vermont. Really, a great place to to grow up, interested in trains, at least at that point of time. Anyway, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of action to see. Um, so, how did that? How did you ultimately get involved with the Green Mountain Railroad? Was that the first railroad that you you hired on with? Um, actually, uh, fresh out of high school, I did manage to get a short period bit of employment with Steamtown at oh, yeah. Riverside. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem there was that Steamtown paid museum wages, which meant that they could pay below minimum wage. Right. At the time, it was $2.50 <laughs> an hour. Yep. To get to Riverside, I had to drive in this old uh, 1969 Ford LTD that I had bought for 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. And as you might expect, the gas cost almost wiped out the wages. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was there for about three months. And that was my introduction to actual working on railroad equipment. Mm -hmm. But I had always held an interest in railroad equipment being uh, that I was doing my self-studying model railroad work. And I was also very interested in the physical operations of the railroad, signal systems, things like that were fascinating to me. And I started collecting materials and doing a lot of study on that. Mm -hmm. This was uh, followed by a series of short-term jobs. And then finally, I landed a, a longer term job, which was working for the local Radio Shack franchise, Claremont, which afforded me a little bit of uh, not experience because I went in there with some experience, but it afforded me with some opportunity to explore my electrical experience because my father had taken several online. Uh, electronic courses, and I was taking those courses right alongside Dad mm -hmm. as he was doing them, I was doing them, two for one. And I spent four years at the Radio Shack, but my entertainment hours uh, were spent uh, some evenings down in Springfield, Vermont, at mm -hmm. the local gin joint known as the Duck Inn. Uh, it had been there for a long time, but yeah. the Duck Inn was also the place where a lot of the Steamtown volunteers, uh, the great number of which were Boston and Maine employees that volunteered their time there, they would go there to have a, a rollicking good time, mm -hmm. and enjoy the music and the dancing and the drinking. And one day, uh, one of you know, I, I got to know some of them quite well, and then one of them looked at me and said, hey, uh, the Green Mountain Railroad is looking for a signal maintainer. I said, hmm, well, that's interesting. <laughs> and uh, I explored that option. I went down to the office in Fellows Falls. I inquired with uh, Bob Adams there. He was the first one I met through the door. And then I talked to Glenn Davis, who was the president of the railroad. Mm -hmm. And within a couple of days, I was told to uh, go meet Tom Hancock up at Ludlow, Vermont, because he was working on a little signal job, because he was doing crossing maintenance for the railroad. Mm -hmm. and I met up with Tom, and one thing led to another, and the next thing you know, I was commuting to Keene to work at uh, Green Mountain Railroad's fresh operation there, because they were expanding. They were going to expand the Keene operation to take taking over the Ashby Lot branch, and they needed somebody to help fill in with the signal maintenance. Mm -hmm. That's actually a perfect perfect transition into, into our next question. Um, 
So in, in his book, Green Mountain Railroad, which is uh, R.W. Nimke's book about the, the Green Mountain, uh, he talks about that, that desire to expand the railroad, about how the Green Mountain, which, which obviously started out only on the former Rutland line from uh, Bellows Falls out to Rutland, um, was looking to expand itself. And they were looking out to expand uh, three-phase acquisition in New Hampshire uh, on those B&M lines in the Keene area. How did that idea come about with the Green Mountain? And uh, what were some of the things that they were desiring to take over about these, these B&M lines? Well, uh, I'm not sure if you can believe everything that he always said. Yeah. There, there was a lot of embellishment in his book, unfortunately. Uh, but I had always come to understand from Bob Adams and Clint Davis that somehow or another, the B&M and the Green Mountain got to talking together they had a meeting of some sort you know just it might have been on other business topics but the bnm may have approached the green mountain asking if they'd be interested in do, performing the switching duties in key mm -hmm. bnm at that time had a five-man crew assignment just for the switcher in key and plus on top of that they had to have a maintenance of way force in key right now, inviting the Green Mountain in as a non-union switching operator would dramatically cut that labor force to the mm -hmm. point where the freight operations, continued freight operations, could remain viable. And that's pretty much how they got started in that. Uh, they were, although Nipke does say that they, they talked about the Cheshire Branch, I'll get more into that in a minute. That really was not a major concern because there was no freight track. So talking about Keene, obviously Keene at one point was was quite a quite a rail hub. And at this point in time, that had diminished somewhat, but but there was still quite a bit of freight uh, business to be had in Keene itself. What were what was the rail business like, the the atmosphere of the rail business like in Keene at that point in time at, at the late 1970s? Well, when I started, it was uh lie of 1981. Mm -hmm. and that was, you know, when they were planning on taking over the Ashley line. Now, they had been operating for about three years in there, two or three. And they used some other local uh, help there. Uh, John Marachal was one of the people they hired. And um, Harold Lero was another one that was a part time person there. But Tom Hancock, who is still alive, was, lives in Elstead, New Hampshire. He was hired as the, uh, the manager of the New Hampshire operations. So he oversaw all the paperwork, did all that on that end. But with the expansion, they needed at least four people. And the other two were moving on to other, other things. They could not devote that much time to, to operate the entire branch line. Uh, the traffic in Keene was actually rather decent. Uh, there was a lot left. Uh, we had numerous customers. Uh, I'll try to list all of them here. Uh, we had, on the east end of the railroad, we, we had Weeder Out Food Warehouse. We had Donahue Beverage, Capital Plumbing and Heating. In the main portion of the yard, uh, um, which was the uh, Connecticut River side of the yard, I'll get it that later, we had Wright Silver Polish. Merrimack Farmers Exchange, Troy Mills, Cheshire Farmers Exchange. On the other side of Main Street, we had Shabbat Coal and Oil. We had Keen Gas, and it was Marlboro Manufacturing, which made the uh, children's furniture and toys. Mm -hmm. So all of those kept us quite busy, actually, before we took over the Ashley line. Mm -hmm. Now, out of all those customers, uh, which ones were, were tended to be the highest uh, highest volume, um, the more regular customers? Weeder Out Foods was actually quite busy. Mm -hmm. uh, the food warehouse uh, had room for several cars on spot inside. It, it was a little uh, cramped because the, the original warehouse design was uh, set up for shorter cars with without cushion draft gears. Oh yeah. And they had doors inside. So the original setup was for five cars on spot. 
but that had shrunk to three because if you're pushing draft gears, you could mm-hmm. spot three cars at a time. And that was indoors. It was at the bottom of a very steep hill with the, uh, an electric garage door in the way. Yeah. Yeah, if anybody uh, is familiar with, with Keene, um, it's the police station, I think it is now, that building um, with the ice, ice rink right next door. Um, but you can still see kind of the incline leading down into where the, the door was. And it is, it's very it is steep. It's very steep, yeah. definitely. The, the rule there was you stop at the top of the hill, open the door first, and then go. Then you go. <laughs> right, exactly. Talking a little bit about, about obviously, the Boston and Maine um, at this point in time, you know, looking to cut where they can, looking to cut um, extra labor where they can, the branch lines, which weren't um, as profitable as they could be in the middle of a bankruptcy. Um, the Green Mountain was able to take over the Ashwilet branch and then the Fort Hill branch, which ran from Brattleboro to Dole Junction, which was the connection uh, with the Ashwilet branch. What were some of the, the major customers on the Ashwilet branch itself? Because uh, obviously Keene had, had a relatively large industrial base, but it's my understanding that there were quite a few customers on the branch itself. Starting at uh, the Keene, mm-hmm. when the B&M was there last, there was one customer in Swansea that was uh, Guthrie Guitar. They would receive carloads of, of wood for construction of their guitars. That was a specialty item, but it was very sporadic, very rare. And by the time we took over, they were, they were not receiving cars. Next down the line in Winchester, there was the AC Lawrence Tannery. Uh, originally that had two very active tracks. Uh, by the time we took over, it was down to just one track being used. They would receive carloads of hides the tanning process, which were shipped in, in the most disgusting boxcars oh, yeah. <laughs> you've ever seen. They would literally be oozing goo out the sides of them in the rusty holes. Um, and they also received carloads of salt for keeping the hides inside. They would keep them salted while they were waiting to be processed so they mm-hmm. rot. Yep. Um, BM prior to us also had. Woodflower Incorporated and New England Box Company. New England Box had closed out before we got there. And Woodflower Incorporated was employed in making uh, dynamite woodflower. This is oh. what they, they would soak with the nitroglycerin to wrap up and make dynamite out of. Uh, and they used sawdust, which came from basically from Keen, Keen Wood Heat. Mm-hmm. And Keen Woodheel would ship their boxcar loads of flour to Winchester, where they'd be unloaded. But wood flour is a volatile item, and one day they suffered a fire from it. And before they could, I think before they even could get the uh, insurance to pay out, get it repaired, uh, some local urchins in Winchester went in there and set fire to the place again mm-hmm. and wiped it out. That was it. Next down the line at uh, the station name of Pisgah Switch was a paper service company. That was uh, one of the local paper mills. And that was fairly active. They would uh, do three, four cars a week. And next from that down the line was Ash Wheelock Paper. Now, Ash Wheelock Paper was the busiest customer on the line. Mm-hmm. You could go in there at any one time and find maybe seven or eight car loads on the spot of cars waiting to be loaded. That was that was that was the business customer. At Hinsdale, we also served the Robinson paper mill, which was downtown Hinsdale. They would use the tracks up by the depot to load and unload unload scrap paper and they load fresh paper. To go out, and mm-hmm. they also received uh, occasional carloads of coal for heating. Okay, yep. There was at one time was there was there a, a warehouse of some sort on the the north? Well, I guess I should backtrack a little bit. So, what became the Fort Hill branch from Brattleboro to Dole Junction was originally the northbound main of the the Boston and Maine, uh, which which crossed over the Connecticut River into East North Massachusetts, but uh, that that was severed when the bridge over the Connecticut River um, was 
basically condemned. And so it became a dead end branch at Dole Junction, just a little bit beyond Dole Junction, so they could reach the Ashwilet branch from Brattleboro. Where did the northbound end when you were running that line out of Brattleboro? How far did it go down towards where the old bridge was? It went south from Dole Junction about a half a mile. It was, it was pretty much just a straight line of sight to the end of track. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there was just a bunch of spikes pulled out. The rails yep. were just unbolted, and that was it. And there was a, there was some sort of industry on that portion of the northbound main in Hinsdale. Was there some? I've I've heard that there was some sort of warehouse in there at some point. Hinsdale Products. Yeah, the name of the mill there was Hinsdale Products. And they had a warehouse there, mm -hmm. and that warehouse suffered a uh, severe uh, fire. It okay. Burned the place right to the ground, and it was so hot that the uh, side track that served it uh, actually warped all out of shape. Oh wow! Hmm. Even even when we were still serving that section of the railroad, there was uh, debris there, burned out forklifts. Yep. Still still sitting there waiting. Hmm. No kidding. So the Green Mountain takes over the Schwelet branch um, and the Fort Hill branch uh, on December 12th, 1981. We were supposed to okay. take it over at that point in time. Uh, the Green Mountain operation actually began on, I think it was January 4th. It was just a lot of delays and mm -hmm. we had the holidays coming up. I believe that was on January 4th. Okay, so in the in the new year of 1982. So a little right. bit a little bit delayed from when it was supposed to happen. Um, what did operations look like at the beginning? Um, what was what was the power that you had on the branch? Um, and and what did a typical Ashwilet branch run look like for the Green Mountain in, in 81 or 82 rather? Well, the, the first train in was operated by the Boston and Maine. Bernie Moon was the engineer, and they brought the Green Mountain S4 number 305 into town along with the fully uh, overhauled Caboose C50, which was set up so we could do the backup moves coming out of Brattleboro, going to and from Brattleboro on the Fort Hill. Uh, just a side note here, all the moves on the Fort Hill branch were backwards because it was a giant switchback move. So if you wanted to end up, you know, you came down the branch going forward, so you backed up to Brattleboro, or you started out of Brattleboro backwards, so you could go forward up to Key. Yep. They brought the train into town, into Keene, and we had the B&M 1115, which was the switcher that we normally use, and Keene followed us there, and all ready to go for them, and they tacked their caboose on the back end, and off they went and left us with the 305 and our fresh C50 caboose to start operations. The typical day was to Get the engine uncovered, we would plug it in in the winter time when it was set up for standby heating. Hand us the engine. Typical operation was to get it uh, fired up, uh, switch out whatever needed to be switched out in Keene, and we would head off to Brattleboro. So the tie down point would have been Keene at the beginning? It was pretty much always the tie down point as long as we were in Keene. Okay. That's, yep. That was our, our originating. Uh, that continued until 
we uh, ended up getting out of Keene. I want to touch on that. Normal, you know, normally we would uh, head in that direction. There wasn't much work to do uh, going towards Brattleboro because virtually all the uh, switching work, except for the AC Lawrence Tannery, all the switching work was uh, trailing point moves out of Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned 305 being the, the designated power um, at the beginning, the, the former Delaware and Hudson uh, ALCO. 303, which was was another former DNH ALCO, also made some time on the Ashwilet branch. Uh, which of the two engines was more common and which of the two engines was more reliable? Uh, the 305 was very reliable up until the day that the, the uh, we'll call it the dog, it's a piece that's on the, that's bolted to the end of the forward end of the crankshaft on the mm -hmm. end block. It has a nub which sticks out, which engages a notch on the fuel pump. There's no actual physical coupling. It's just yeah. a, it's a, kind of like a quill drive, if you want to call it that. Uh, that nub broke off and <laughs> the oil pump stopped. <laughs> so that was, yeah. that was it for the 305 until that could be replaced. Yep. The 303 was, I, I met the 303 came in and remained. Oh, okay. Period. Yep. Uh, the 303 was pretty much as reliable as the 305, but the, the wheels were much more worn out. Did from time to time, no, there's a couple pictures floating around. Um, I don't know this, I don't know if this was during the BM period of time or if this was the Green Mountain period of time, but uh, did you ever use BM power in a lease situation uh, when you needed it, or was it always Green Mountain power? Uh, no, we never did use any BM power at all, except. Okay. Except for before we took over the branch, I've so just switching the B and M switcher. Okay, yeah, uh, and that alternated between the eleven fifteen and the eleven seventeen. Uh, the eleven fifteen was Jingles, and the eleven seventeen was Marianne. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned a couple of names there at the beginning. Uh, were there any other notable employees that uh, that you worked with uh, regularly on the branch? Well, the uh, the first four people that were hired underneath uh, Tom Hancock there were Kent Cotton, he's now deceased, uh, Charlie Ramsey, whose brother, I believe, still works for Green Mountain, although he's virtually on the retirement line right now, mm -hmm. and myself and Douglas Lamoureux. Uh, he has since passed away from cancer. When I first showed up there on uh, on the first day, we were supposed to be there at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and there were three of us there. About twenty minutes after nine, uh, Doug Lamo walked into the to the office, the the freight office, and said, "Looked over and said, here you guys are hiring." <laughs> um, Hancock looked at him and says, "Did you bring your work boots?" <laughs> <laughs> so I always used to chide Doug because we worked together for the rest of his career on the railroad. I used to always chide him. I have 20 minutes on you. Don't give me any guff. <laughs> <laughs> but we did everything on the railroad. Uh, mm -hmm. We did all the maintenance away and we operated the trains. So two of us would generally, generally be assigned to the train mm -hmm. for uh, you know, a period of days and the rest would do maintenance away work. And then we'd switch off, go back and forth like that. So nobody had to get stuck doing just one odd job. Obviously, one of the things that um, kind of the, I'm sure the maintenance crews had to struggle with and, and something that seems to have been a major, uh, major facet of the operation was, was the winter, specifically that first winter, which seems to have been pretty severe. What, what was it like starting a new operation on a branch line, which I'm sure the track situation wasn't, uh, wasn't as good as it could have been in the wintertime? That first winter was absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the sincerest form, it was horrible. Uh, we took over at probably the, the worst possible time that anybody could ever take over a rail line. We didn't have excessive amounts of snow on the ground. It, it was probably 10 inches over the top of the rail beside the, beside the track. Mm -hmm. You know, if you account for the road, but that's, that's a significant amount of snow. But it rained, and then it snowed, and oh, it yeah. rained, and then it snowed, and it turned into concrete between the rails. 
it, it literally was so hard that it would lift the traction motors on the locomotives right up off the rail and you couldn't move. Oh, jeez. And that's how hard it was. And we went out there. We borrowed b and snow plow on more than one occasion. And we went out to, to plow out the line and use the flanger. Mm-hmm. And one memorable day, we were trying to go from Keene to Brattleboro. Well, I say Brattleboro, but there was no plowing because you couldn't turn the plow. Right. At Dole Junction. We derailed the plow 27 times in 24 hours. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's how hard the snow was. Uh, they finally had to resort to getting a B&M uh, bucket loader to come and literally bucket load the entire branch. Jeez. So that was that was 22 miles from Dole Junction up. The, the Fort Hillside didn't suffer anywhere near it. Then. And now on the branch. In terms of track conditions, uh, which spots tended to be worse than others? Um, obviously, the branch follows the, the river up into Keene. Um, were there any spots that were prone to washouts or any spots that you had continuous problems with derailments? Interesting question. Let's, let's talk about derailments in general first. We did not have that many derailments on the main line, so to speak. There was a couple notable major ones that were below Hinsdale towards Dole Junction. Uh, that, that area didn't see a lot of sunlight in some of the spots. So the snow got us in there one, one day, a box car derailed got way off the tracks and able to back up out of the ditch after doing copious amounts of hand shoveling. Mm-hmm. Um, but during the non-snow period, there was a, a time where 305 hits a wide gauge. It dropped between the rails and it was on an elevated piece of track. And it was the downhill wheels that went off between the rails, but the rails merely pushed apart. They didn't mm-hmm. roll over or anything. So to this day, with the wheels on the 305 have lines on them where you can see where the rail etched the uh, side tread of the wheels. Oh, yeah. They're still there. Uh, but that was precarious because we had to jack the locomotive up in place because it was leaning so heavy over because it was on a elevated curve and it was still on the outside rail. Mm-hmm. So imagine the extra lean it had to it, plus a couple of cars behind it. Yep. And we had to use jacks to, to pick it up in the air and let the rail pop back under the wheels, which it did. It took us two or three days to get that done. Uh, another notable derailment, two of them actually involved propane cars. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of them was during the winter time. And I was riding in the caboose. We had a three-man crew this day. And I was riding in the caboose, and we were going up past paper service company. And there was this one area, I still can't explain it, this is one spot behind paper service towards Keene for paper service where there was the old G. Robertson paper mill, which is an abandoned paper mill. But it had a siding which paper service company would use for loading and unloading cars. Right next to that was an area of soft track where it was always soggy. And the BNM went in there and they put in 130 pound rail that was about 10 rail lengths long. Put in this huge rail in there. And I was riding in the caboose and I was looking out the forward door. We had a propane car right ahead of the caboose. And of course, you're not supposed to do that nowadays, but we didn't have any other cars. Right. So I'm watching the wheels as we roll along through this area. And okay, here we come. We're on the high iron. And I watched that propane car just walk right up and off the track. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes, but I had the radio in my hand. So I, I said, stop, stop, stop. And we stopped. We only went a car length mm-hmm. altogether. And we couldn't understand why it went off. We never found out why it went off. It just walked up and off. Hmm. It, was, it wasn't the leading car in the train. It was near the tail. There should have been no reason whatsoever for it to do that. It wasn't rocking. It just did it. 
<laughs> so that, that, that was no big deal. But the more interesting aspect was that we had to continue with the key. And we were a little nervous about the other cars. Why, why did this happen? Because we had uh, one or two other propane cars with it. Mm-hmm. And I chose to be the caboose. I rode the tail end of the car while the other two guys were in the It was a very cold night. It was like below zero. And I rode the rest of the way into Keene like that. <laughs> People called it in and said, hey, there's a guy riding on your train. <laughs> and they said, it's okay. He works for us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no further incidents, though, on that. But there was another time where we were bringing propane to Keene. And it was one car just acted on. You expect freight cars to walk from side to side. This one propane car would shuck left and right. Hmm. I, I have no idea why. It just did it, and I didn't trust it. Well, that car got brought into the team, got spotted, got unloaded, and this brings me to my next topic where we had another area that was a soft spot. There was a little place about a mile south of the Route 101 crossing in Keene. It was called New Curve. They called it New Curve. Um, It was a spot where the Ashwilat River, there was an aquifer of some sort which emptied out under the right of way. Mm -hmm. And it would never stay uh, stable. So there was this shoe fly built around it. Just a jug handle. Yep. You can see a jug handle on the highway. This is a jug handle in the railroad that just went around this soft spot. So we're pulling this short train through the, the new curve. And it gets to the propane car that I didn't trust. And I'm crawling. I'm doing like three miles an hour. I said, Looked at, I had Doug Lamerell with me at that time as my conductor. I said, I don't trust that car. And I'm looking back out the window, and all of a sudden, poof, on the ground. Yeah. I, I knew it. I knew yeah. it was that. I knew it was going to happen. It maybe went five feet on the ground. Yeah. But those, those were the big four derailments on that, on that track. Mm-hmm. You know, the only other ones were due to uh, snow plows. We had other occasions with the snow plow. Uh, the most memorable derailment that was the fastest rerailment was right at uh, Dole Junction. There was a private crossing there, and it was icy, and we were shoving the plow across the crossing. All of a sudden, the plow was at about a 30 degree angle to the main line. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, that's not a good spot. Uh, back it up quick. Yeah. And it followed its own wheel ruts right back onto the rails. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we got out, chipped the ice away, kept going. That was, that was a good one. That was lucky. Yeah. Other plowed derailments were much tougher where you had to shovel out, get underneath with frogs, and then, you know, put blocking down a tie place. Just a, the usual pain in the neck. Mm-hmm. But those were the, the major ones. There were other ones on side tracks. Now, getting into Keene itself, um, I think one of the most famous aspects of the railroad in Keene was the Main Street crossing, uh, which which a lot of people said Keene had the widest Main Street in the in the world. Uh, what what was that crossing like? Did you ever have any in, in, any uh, incidents on that crossing or any issues uh, going over that or switching throughout the day? Uh, let me let me preface that by saying Keene did not have the widest Main Street, but unless you call it Main Street, if you have to hold to the name Main Street. It might have been the widest. Broad Street in Claremont, where I live, was wider. Wider, yeah. <laughs> Much wider. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yes, there, there's some interesting anecdotes about Key Main Street. Uh, we didn't have any incidents on the Main Street, but uh, just right next to it, we did once. Uh, we were shoving, shoving a uh, empty car load from Shabbat Cole across the cross, and I'm riding the car. Coca Cola delivery truck backed up right when we were on the other side of the crossing. We, cleared, mm-hmm. we were completely on the crossing. He was backing up, 
and it, his top corner hit the top corner of the, the hopper car. Oh, put a dent in his truck. <laughs> so I looked at him. I says, want to go through any paperwork? He says, no. Well, I didn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was funny. But that was the only incident at Main Street. Um, speaking of streets in Keene, uh, one of our regular duties was to go and sweep out flangeways. We keep the, keep the, the flangeways in the street clear of debris. So that when winter came, it was a uh, brainer that there wouldn't be anything there. Uh, some of that was, was interesting because you go out and keep being a college town, some of the scenery was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So you're working away on the crossing, you have your shovels and, and you know, sometimes a pick with you to, to clean out the hard stuff. All of a sudden, somebody would begin tapping on the rail. You know, tink, 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 tink. That was a signal to look. <laughs> look at what's right around you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I went to Keene State, so I I, uh, I walked that right away quite a bit. And I, it, it's built up now, but I could imagine it was still still quite a college town back then. Well, more interesting was the fact that, uh, okay, yeah, the, the dorms bordered the, the Ash Wheelot branch. Right. And occasionally we'd come back after dark. <laughs> uh, they they really needed to put shades on their windows. <laughs> yeah, in yeah. some instances, they needed some shades on the windows. <laughs> they wanted to be a little little more modest. For sure, something that's interesting about Keene, I think, um, and that that shows up a little bit with pictures, and you can kind of see it in some aerial pictures if you look at some aerial shots from from the early eighties. Um, was the the enormous amount of Green Mountain boxcars that ended up being stored. Uh, in Keene on on the Cheshire branch, portions of the Cheshire branch. How did that come about? How did the how did the Green Mountain decide they wanted to store freight cars in Keene? And um, what was it like bringing that that many cars out to Keene? Well, it was a matter of necessity because the Green Mountain proper didn't have enough room. Mm -hmm. Back in the early part of the seventies, there was this giant boxcar boom. Everybody was buying boxcars. Uh, everybody needed boxcars. Uh, but 40 foot boxcars, which they were, fell out of favor mm -hmm. rapidly. Well, the problem with that is that Green Mountain also had fleets of 50 foot boxcars. And the 50 foot boxcar boom started to end at the end of the 70s. Everybody was going to Bolt uh, Vermont and fresh differential cars. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, the Green Mountain was faced with a railroad that didn't have enough sidetrack capacity for all the 50 foots that needed storage, as well as the 40 foots, which were really going nowhere. Right. So the decision was made to take the 40 foot box cars and send them all down to Keene and store them on the available endpoints of the Cheshire branch. Mm -hmm. And of course, they became a, a landmark, so to speak. <laughs> right. Now, sadly, uh, one of the things that occurred with that didn't help the Keene Railroad situation. Had things happened a little differently, Keene's railroading might have been saved. And in this, I'm talking about the actual lease of the trackage to the Green Mountain Railroad in Keene. The Green Mountain's lease on the, we'll call it the east end of the Cheshire Branch, east or south, whichever you prefer, at, it ended at Jocelyn Station. Now, Jocelyn was south of the, the river there coming out of Marlborough, and that's south of the, the, the big stone arch bridge that everybody knows so well. Mm -hmm. If the, the decision had been made to clear out whatever little brush there was in the way already and store those boxcars all the way down to Jocelyn, it would have stopped what happened in the early 80s from happening. And that was when Guilford Transportation took control of the Boston Maine. They decided to rip up the rails on the Cheshire. So they hired the contractors to rip up the railroad. Well, the contractors get up to Keene, 
They were supposed to stop at Johnston. They didn't stop at Johnston. They kept right on going, heading for Eastern Avenue, where the end of the boxcar strip was. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that, they reached the bridge over Route 101. So there it was one night, middle of the summer, that a contractor crew was torching away at the bridge, taking it down. Nobody on the Green Mountain was aware of this happening. Uh, one of the local police officers for Keene, who happened to be a rail man, sort of realized what was going on and tried to halt them from, from doing what they were doing. And, uh, the word that he got in response was, oh, we're sorry, but the main supports have been cut. We've got to finish this job. Mm -hmm. And the key problem with this was that that bridge prevented truck traffic from using Route 101. Uh. If they wanted to, there was a circuitous route around through Jocelyn that they could take to get to Keene. But that truck, that bridge had a clearance which prevented the taller trucks from getting into town and protected the railroad in essence. So if the cars had been stored out there to prevent them from ripping the railroad up, that bridge would have never come down. Keene had three or four different trucking companies. And as soon as Route 101 was opened up, it was a feeding frenzy. Mm -hmm. the, the trucking companies uh, started undercutting all the rail rates in town. And that was it. We, the Green Mountain, which was just a switching operator, me and Emma was doing all the way billing and getting the real revenue. They couldn't compete anymore. The traffic was starting to dry up. Very rapid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was looking at some of the numbers, and, and in 1977, there was 2,200 car loads, and then um, in 1981, it was down to 834. So yeah, it's quite a sharp decline, for sure. And I think Glenn Davis had, had said that they would need to make 1,100 car loads a year to break even, uh, which sounds about right for an operation of that length, uh, 22 or so miles, you know, to make it up to Keene. Uh, so Keene ended first, correct? The, the Green Mountain pulled out of Keene before they pulled out of the rest of the Ishwilet branch? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was a matter of balancing the amount of time that we spent there versus on the rest of the branch, which was a lot shorter. It cut the run in half, basically, because we weren't passing uh, his God switch down there. We weren't even going to Winchester anymore because the tannery had closed down. Mm -hmm. uh, it really shouldn't have happened, but Keene wasn't interested in the railroad. They were a college town. They just had no interest in, in keeping the railroad there. And like I say, the trucking companies had come in, cut our throats. Then they cut each other's throats. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single trucking company left in Keene. Nope. Maybe nope. one. Maybe one. Maybe. Right now. Yes. Uh, but yeah, oh yeah. You have to remember, like I said, Green Mountain Railroad only received a switching fee. So that was a set dollar amount per car load. I don't remember what it was. It might have been $300. It was 50 in my property. Mm -hmm. that, that, that did not change. And the Green Mountain Railroad was steadfast in that they weren't going to go there and switch out B&M's cars lose money at it. Right. That was the bottom line. If the Green Mountain Railroad had been receiving the full freight amount, probably it would have lasted longer. Mm -hmm. I can say that. There was probably enough business in propane, coal, groceries left. The beer business was good. That was very high revenue. <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> that was very high revenue. But we didn't get that. We didn't right. get the high revenue dollars. You know, the same with propane. All we got was a per car switch. Mm -hmm. And it made a big difference. What always kind of interested me about the Keene operation and the Schwelot operation, when you think about what the BNM was doing on its other branch lines that they didn't really want to operate anymore, is that there was no direct sale of the branch line. How, how come the Green Mountain was never offered to purchase 
the they line. Were. Oh, they, they were. were. They were. But Green Mountain, it was a recession period. Yeah. They, they just did not have the, the, the bank goal to do such a thing. Okay. Had the, the VTR Green Mountain merger occurred earlier, I'd say the Ashley Lot would have survived and thrived. Mm -hmm. Or at least until the flood came. Oh, right. Yep. Yep. Which wiped out the, the paper mills, right? Yeah, that was, that was uh, a comedy of errors. It was tragic. Mm -hmm. uh, the result there was uh, the operator of the, the dam did not open the floodgates until it was too late. The floodwaters mm -hmm. went around the dam and eroded a new channel, which also took it on a direct collision course with paper service company, wiped them out, and they went downstream and wiped Ash Wheelot paper out at the same time. Mm -hmm. When you first started working in that area, I think you said it was around 1981, you know, you said that Keene clearly had no interest in maintaining the railroad. They were a college town, didn't really have any interest. Even at that time, could you sort of see the end in sight for the railroad in Keene or... At that time, did you just not quite imagine that one day trains would entirely be gone from Keene? Just curious what it was like from uh, that perspective when you started uh, working there. Well, we were always hopeful, but uh, we could see the declines. Like I said, the bridge was the dividing line. Before that came down, things were fairly rosy. As soon as that bridge was gone, we were done for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We put there was no way to compete with the pricing. Everybody started going to truck. Even even a temporary stoppage like that. I mean, the trucks cut their own throats eventually. If somebody could have weathered that stoppage, they might have gone back and uh, you know gone back to the rail again. You know, new business comes and goes. You know, I could see I could see a lot of potential in Keene today. If uh, uh, the Vermont rail system was still in there with the marketing tools that they have, King would probably still be viable. Mm -hmm. I, could see, I could see reload operations, a propane plant, a oh, yeah. salt, salt bin, barns, the whole works. Yep. You know, that would be there. No problem at all. It, mm -hmm. it, would, it would be there. I think when think, people think about the Green Mountain operations um, on the Ashwilet and Dakin, it seems like it lasted longer than it did uh, just because it was such a unique operation, but it ended up, um, it ended up only lasting until 1983. Um, so as traffic dried up and as, as the track was cut back down to um, south of Winchester, how did, how did things come to an end uh, for the Green Mountain and eventually the, the tracks in, in themselves on the branch when, when the B&M canceled the lease? As long as the paper mills were were going, things were consistent. But uh, their traffic had started to slow down to you know, your own business. One of those recession periods, you know, they extended the recession into the 80s and uh, well, their business. It was just not enough car loads to keep the green mountain there and operating. Mm -hmm. At times, it's been slightly different. Yeah probably would have uh, continued. We would eventually have lost the mills. There's no doubt about that. that the actions have been taken there to prevent the uh, flooding. They, they were gone. They were right. Go. So the future was not there. The A.C. Lawrence Tannery in uh, Winchester has lost out to environmentalists, to polluting, and not put them out of business. There wasn't anything else on the line. Mm -hmm. When the Green Mountain finally left, you know, it was left to the B and M. The, the branch was still operational, obviously, yeah. because the B and M went into Keene with their own scrap trains. Yeah. So Green Mountain was not the last operator in Keene. The B and M was right, but not Revenue. Would that have been technically um, Guilford Transportation or the Boston and Maine? It, it um, was Guilford, but yeah, it was very early. Very early on, I didn't have the Springfield terminal situation yet. Now, while, while we're on the subject of, of operating at the key, I know that the uh, 
question about the Cheshire result. Yes. Like yeah. So the Cheshire branch, yes, it would have made connecting Keene with North Walpole a wonderful thing, but it was also many miles of track to maintain with nothing on it. Right. So the Fremont really did not want to pick up the, the, the Cheshire just for that reason. Had there been anything else on there that would have uh, made the operation viable? Yes, certainly. Had history been kinder to Keene, uh, you go back in time to when Steamtown envisioned itself moving into Keene, had that happened, the Cheshire would have survived. The Cheshire was a fairly good railroad. Wrong with it, it was a part of the water. Uh, it had its spots of needed work, but it was just left to die. Right. The Ashwilot itself, uh, condition wise, we, we didn't touch upon that actually, but condition wise, the Ashwilot had pretty rough track. Mm -hmm. By the time the BM had uh, handed it over, it was starting to get tender. It needed a lot of tire work, which we were doing. And most of the rail in, on the line was uh, 75 and 85 pound rail, except for one area, which was from about the Westport station side, which was just west of, just east of Route 10 down in Winchester. Mm -hmm. uh, and extending for about a mile and a half down past the Mad Knox Speedway, there was a section of 107 pound six bolt rail hmm. down through there. And it was just as smooth as glass. Mm -hmm. And you could, you could really motor right along in that section. <laughs> um, we always liked to motor right along in that section because uh, Route 10 was a fairly busy crossing with just flashers protecting it. And if you took too long, people don't sit and wait for the flashers. They always cut in front of you. So we loved to get going fast and furious through their horn blaring. As far as the rest of the branch goes, like I said, there, there was some rough areas mm -hmm. that track. A lot of uh, what we used to call uh, square joints. You know, the rails didn't curve. The rails stayed straight, and they bended the joints. That's how yep. you got around curves. Until you get down to the Fort Hill, which was the former main line. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a mixture of 112-pound jointed rail. Some 115 pound former Hoosick Tunnel welded rail hmm. and some 100 pound rail. Now, from Dole Junction uh, up to about Fort Hill Station, it was the 112 jointed rail, which was in pretty good shape. When you got onto the welded rail, oh, the stuff was wonderful, except for one thing. Like I say, it was reportedly former Hoosier Tunnel Rail, and the base of the rail was rotted so that uh, anchors didn't hold on the rail very well. Mm. So two things happened. In the summertime, it would develop sun kinks. In the wintertime, it would develop pull-aparts of the, few, the very few joints that were on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was, uh, although we could fly right along, you could, you could do 40 miles an hour on that well the rail no problem. Mm, oh, yeah. But there was one spot we came around the curve because we're going backwards. Came around the curve and I said, okay, slow down. And <laughs> there was a sun kink starting. And at the time I saw it, it was only about three inches out of line. So 
we tiptoed through it. Um, by later in that day, it had it grown quite a bit. So we went out the next morning to get rid of it. We brought the, the torches along so we could cut the end of the rail off. We didn't have a, a rail saw on our end of the railroad. All we had mm-hmm. the torches. We're trying to torch the end of the rail. The rail off shorter, but the sun is beating down on the welded rail, and the gap was closing faster than we could torch the pieces <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was a little bit interesting. I'm trying yeah. to fix that with just hand tools. We did get it done. The other spot was where, like I said, the joints were. Every summer we put the bolts. Well, actually, every summer it was only a couple summers. We put the bolts in, in the summer. In the middle of the winter, there'd be a six inch gap because it would shear the bolts right off. Mm-hmm. The rail would contract and shear the bolts off. So we come along and, you know, it had the, uh, it had six bolt rail joints on it where two bolts were on one rail and it, the four bolts extended across the other rail. So it was this giant slip joint. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we come around, we, it was on a straight piece of track, we tiptoe across it, and the next time it warmed up, the gap would close. <laughs> All because it was based on welded right. rail. North of that welded rail towards Brattleboro was a 100 pound rail, and that was rough. The ties in there were, were shot. Mm-hmm. It got very rough in there. You had, to, you had to go 10 miles an hour, but, and it was a rough ride at 10. For sure. And did you ever have any issues on the bridge coming into Brattleboro? No, actually, the bridge was in fine shape. Mm-hmm. That, that, that bridge was uh, super elevated for 60 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. Which was made it interesting when you're doing 10 and you're leaning over. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's particularly strange when you have a nice, uh, when you have this huge straight truss bridge, which most people don't realize that one of the bridges, the easternmost truss, was almost wide enough for three tracks. Mm-hmm. And this is because it was on, you know, it had curved track going through it and elevated. So it had to have room for two, it was originally built for two tracks, but they never did it. The second bridge was straight, so it was only wide enough for two tracks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, um, being that you were one of the one of the last people to to operate revenue rail freight in Keene and in the in the Keene area. In the in the early eighties, what what were your takeaways from from starting your career there and, and being able to witness that? Um, not only from a railroader's perspective as somebody in the industry, but as a rail historian as you are. Well, my biggest reflection on the Ashley lot was how much fun it was. Mm-hmm. It was to me a very large model railroad. <laughs> um, being being a, a rail nut and a modeler along with being a, a budding career railroader, it was, it was fun. Mm-hmm. We, we had, it was a, we were a family, basically, with, with my blessed operated line. We were one happy family. So just operations in general, everybody was friendly, everybody was cordial, nobody got, got uh, PO'd at each other or anything like that. It was, it was just a, a wonderful operation. Mm-hmm. And we were there pretty much by ourselves. There was a, a couple occasions where uh, they had to bring down the maintenance away guys from the Butlin side of things, you know, the Butlin Railroad side of the river. They had to bring that down to the Ash Wheelot to help out in you know, a couple of these derailment sites. Mm-hmm. And they were terrified of the Ash <laughs> Wheelot. <laughs> they'd get yeah. their high rail truck on the track and they wouldn't go more than one mile an hour there, you know. Meanwhile, we'd zip back and forth. Yeah. Because we were used to it. But that's that's really what it was. It was it was just plain fun. Um we had we had some memorable occasions, you know. Uh, there was one day that we were at Brattleboro because we used to get our way billing. We go into the Brattleboro Freight Office, the C V office hosted the the BNM agent gave him a, a spot for a desk and stuff like that. We were in there visiting the agent, and a northbound train went by. Uh, it would have been the equivalent of SJ3, I believe, or SJ1, I forget which. They changed the 
four letter designation. Uh, what by what through town while we were in there, and all of a sudden the telephone line on his desk went berserk, and, and it stopped dead. And we just looked at each other, and I was the first one to speak, and I says, "Well, that didn't sound good." <laughs> And sure enough, they had derailed, and that's what uh, did the damage to the West River Bridge. Oh, yeah. And caused the uh, reroutes over the northern. So we were there the moment that derailment happened. Yeah. Thankfully, it didn't affect our traffic too much because most of ours came from south of Brattleboro, so we didn't have any uh, problems in that respect. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that, was, that was a moment you just don't forget. Eventually, we had switched to having the uh, 305 station at Brattleboro, of course, once we get out of Keene, park the engine over by the, uh, the freight platform. We didn't have any way to plug it in in the wintertime. And it was the last summer, so once that happened, you, the only thing you do was leave it running, which we didn't like to do. But yeah, we had, we had uh, distributed a lot of the boxcars to the paper mills. Uh, for storage, uh, bought several. Uh, other cars were stored on on the uh, on Port Hill, south of the Dole Junction Switch, mm -hmm. and uh, that was pretty much it. When we, when we got them out of there, we stored them wherever we could. A few of them were stored just west of Paper Service, but not I mean, there weren't too many because most everything fit down below that switch. Is quite a long tail track. Mm -hmm. So when the, uh, the client came, they came down with a couple of RS1s and uh, put us all together and up to the fellow souls. That was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was it. Yep. And then the rails came up on the branch in the next two years, over the next two years? Well, key did. It took, oh, yeah. uh, took considerably longer to get the uh, Ash Wheelot branch and salt farm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to put in a couple of notes here about the, the general here. Yeah. Uh, Splice them in elsewhere. Uh, the Ash Wheelot was originally the extension of the Connecticut River Railroad to reach Keene. One must remember that in the 1800s, you had the Pittsburgh Railroad, it was the main line. So it was a separate operation from Boston and Maine. Boston and Maine had the central Massachusetts branch to get across the state, and there was nothing else in Massachusetts for them. The next line to the north was from Hillsboro across to Keene, and then down through uh, South Vernon Junction at the time, and on to Greenfield. Above that, it was Claremont Branch in Northern. So for any westbound B and M traffic to reach customers, they didn't have a lot of options, so they went in through Keene. So Keene was a busy place at the time. The yard there was divided into two different sections. You had the Pittsburgh side, and then you had the Connecticut River Railroad side. Uh, Manchester and Keene basically ended right at the, the yard limits. Even uh, in the operations we had, in order to get from one side of the yard to the other, there was a tail track that was only three cars long. If you wanted to bring cars into the Connecticut River side of the yard, you took your engine and two cars at a time through the tail track, which brought it up against Main Street. Originally, there were two tracks across Main Street, but they uh, made a deal with the town to cut it off to just the main line. And left this odd stub. They didn't tie it in, so you didn't have to do the switchback. Mm -hmm. Get across. You had two separate pieces of yard there. The, the other side of Main Street on the west side, uh, there again, there was two separate sections of switching. You had the, the Treasure Branch side uh, that went out to Marlboro Manufacturing. And Gas was on the Y, which would switch off the, the very west end of the Y. And 
on the other leg of the Y, you had to switch to uh, shampoo coal and oil, uh, heat industrial paper, which is an interesting place to spot cars, by the way. Uh, remember I mentioned that the box cars got longer? They had a door top load also. Uh, it wasn't under Green Mountain, but under b &M, they had a car come in with a cushion underframe. And they needed to spot the car on the door. Yes, they did spot the car at the door, but you see at the end of the track was a concrete block wall. So to, they got the car door on spot, but they also punched a 24-inch deep hole in the concrete block wall. <laughs> so in, in later years, when you spot the car, you put it on spot, and the coupler would be in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I wonder if that hole is still there. Probably not. <laughs> They may have matched it, it may still be there. I don't know. Yeah. Shabbat Coal was, was a treat because they had the, uh, the spot there with the, the four big silos. I'm not sure if they're still bringing coal into town or not. I don't know who it is. That's still an active silo. Yep. It is. It is. Okay, yep. Good. Not and rail. I know, <laughs> I know that I had bought coal from them back yep. when I, uh, after the actual realize had ceased. Uh, I was actually keeping. My house with some coal because I had a coal stove. And I had to buy it by the time. Yep. Come up with a truck, unload it to the solar window into the old coal bin. Oh, yeah. Where I was living. Yeah, I guess this kind of fits in with what uh, we were talking about earlier, but it's kind of an interesting uh, place to close, I guess. Um, I've heard from time to time that, that there are some in Keene that regret losing the rail service, um, you know, in and out of town. Do you recall any serious public reaction? Uh, to the news that Keene was losing its rail service. I remember reading a couple of articles written by Tony Reddington uh, to various newspapers about the end of rail service in Keene and how much of a of a mistake it was going to be. Do you recall a lot of public backlash at the time, or was it just something that kind of fizzled out and was, was let go? Pretty much went out with a fizzle. Yeah. It just, yeah. It just uh, was pretty much ignored because everybody is academics then. Teens College Town, that's what they were concentrating on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still that way today. There's really not a lot of uh not a lot else there. Um, you know, obviously Steamtown had a chance and that would have brought tourism, but that never happened and the in industry went away and uh there's really nothing nothing else there except restaurants in the college. Let's let's touch upon uh, switching some of the customers on the Yeah, page. I'd like I'd like to hear about that. Okay. The AC Lawrence Tannery was a uh, basically a southbound switching on the branch mm -hmm. towards Brownville. A switch which led down a, a bit of a grade and across one of the local streets there, the bottom, and you stop, get the gate open, and you put cars in on the sidetrack, which was tender at best. And, are already previously stated that the box cars would be oozing goo out of them. So the ground there was really quite disgusting. And you go in there and you had to watch everything you walked on. And generally speaking, even from the main line, I wouldn't even ride the cars down because they were so gross. So I'd walk ahead down to the bottom and we'd, we'd put cars in there. And they had a, a door where, you, where they would unload the, the hides. Um, there was one day where uh, the gauge in there spread. One of those easy repairs, pick it up and then put a gauge rod in. But just, just digging the ground up with the gauge rod in was awful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Down below at uh, Pisgah Switch, where paper service was, I mentioned that they had uh, switching in both directions. The old Robertson paper mill was uh, a switch off the main there with a, uh, a side track that went up a little hill to um, a loading dock or unloading dock. It was mostly unloading, they didn't unload scrap paper stored in the old mill as a warehouse. So in the wintertime, you had to be careful shoving up that grade. Sometimes it was a little tough in the summertime with the weeds on the rails because you couldn't yep. get any traction. 
on occasion, if we wanted to pull a car out of there and bring it towards Keene, we'd let it roll out on the grade so it was on the other side of the engine. Mm -hmm. uh, in later years, uh, when we had that as a terminating point on the railroad, years, I should say years, just a couple of years, when that was the terminating point on the railroad, uh, we'd bring the, the caboose up, we'd uh, tie it down on the main line there, a couple of car lengths, uh, west of the switch, we car was up in there, we pull it off spot, tie the brake on it on the grade, then we put the engine up the main line out of the way, and then we let the car roll out onto the caboose. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we would run backwards to the junction. So we'd go forwards to Brattleboro because it was a shorter ride in that case. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the paper service siding, which was served in the opposite direction, that was a rather tender sidetrack mm -hmm. where when you put cars in there, literally the wheels would sink into the dirt and the weeds and and the, the rails you couldn't see them. You could not see the rails. They were mm -hmm. so far below the ground. But uh, it, it worked and they did keep using cars and rail service there and there, there's still boxcars there that we left the uh, 40 footers. That were That's right. That yep. Still there. Yep. Yeah. Ashley Lot paper. That was a different story. Uh, that siding was very steep coming down off the main line because the main line was on a grade already. And the, uh, the car spots varied in how far down below we were from the, the main line. The furthest down spot was out on the, on the end of a trestle. And that was one and a half car heights below the main line. So it gives you an idea of how far down it went. Great. Now, at this time, we weren't using radios very much. Most everything we were doing was, was hand signs. We didn't use radios except on rare occasions like uh, in the caboose where we had a portable which we could plug in. So a suitcase mm -hmm. radio. Yeah. We didn't have handhelds. So everything we did there was with hand signs. And when you have two men switching, it got to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Especially in the winter because paper mills develop so much steam and it would obscure your view almost everywhere. Oh, yeah. So we'd come down, we'd tie on the cars there to pull out. If we had cars to pull out or empties to pull out, loads, whatever. You'd make the hitch, you'd, you'd go down, uh, the engine, you'd, you'd pull slack on it, first off. You'd go down, you'd be out of sight of the engine. Okay, there's another hitch to make down here. So you go back up. You walk back through the fog, so you're with inside of the engine. Mm -hmm. Give them a give them a come ahead or a backup to to move a few feet. Okay, stop. Walk down. Can we get the hitch? Uh, no. I'll walk back up. Give them another sign. A couple more feet. <laughs> so walk back down. Yeah, we got the hitch. Okay. Yeah. Then you have to climb down, get the air put together, and then go pop the handbrakes on it. Now you could do this. Two or three times in, in one switching, uh, mm -hmm. switching session. So you pull all these cars out, then you have to go get the cars that you brought to go in off the main and bring them down in. That got a little challenging because you could only go just so far without being seen. So you had to go through this whole process. And it took quite a while to get cars on spot. Mm -hmm. Get it just right because there, there was a couple spots that were a little touchy. You had to get it just right for the dock plates to, to fit between posts. And yep. Yep. But it was a very busy place. And switching there in the summertime was a treat, especially if you got there at noon. Because one of the girls who worked in the office used to like to come out and sun herself on the bales of paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very interesting stuff. 
Um, did they normally get 40 or 50 foot box cars in there? Was that was like, cause I know you had mentioned that some of the industries were, were set up for various size box cars. Now was the Schwelet paper built for 40 and was getting 50 or were they always getting 40? Um, no, they, they had a long dock. Okay. Long length five stock. So car length was really not an issue except for the spots beyond the dock. You had a, yeah, there were a couple spots down there on the trestle. Oh, yeah. Yep. Totally separate. And there was a period of time there where we actually tried bringing bunker sea oil in mm -hmm. uh, for that on load there. Used it was originally coal, and it switched to bunker oil. And we had brought car loads of oil down in there. It was a test, but the problem with bunker C is that it had to get there in a timely manner so that it, it, they didn't have to spend a lot of time heating it. Right, yeah. Bunker, bunker was shipped in the tank cars hot. But by the time they would get there, they'd be getting cold again. And they mm -hmm. would spend an exorbitant amount of time heating the cars. Yeah. They were equipped with steam pipe connections on the tank cars. So, you know, a lot of a lot of your loadout was at that end of the, the dock. Your mm -hmm. scrap paper unloading was at the upper end of the dock. Yep. Yep. But it was fun. That's important. That's the important thing. It was you enjoyed it and that it was memorable and I think, you know, when you have an operation like that, that's so unique when you think about the B&M, um, you know, have Keene having been an important location, uh, Cheshire County having been an important location, and, you know, the last significant freight operations not being Boston and Maine, but leased to another operation. Uh, it's just a, such a unique thing that I think not a lot of people are familiar with. I think, I think that operation really is kind of a forgotten, forgotten operation when you think about the history of the freight business on the B&M and in New Hampshire in general. I think it's something that not a lot of people pay a lot of attention to, but it was so unique and so interesting. Yeah, you did ask about 40-foot cars. And I yeah. could, could uh, supplement that with that. While we were serving Merrimack Farmers Exchange mm -hmm. and Cheshire's Farmer Exchange in Keene itself, they regularly received 40-footers. Yeah. Yep. That was that was pretty much the last use of 40 footers for loads coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, Marlboro Manufacturing out on the west end of the Cheshire section of the operation, they would load uh, Green Mountain 40 footers. That was one place where we did use the, the Green Mountain 40 footers. Mm -hmm. The uh, Merrimack cars were those the BM 40 footers, or at that point in time, had they been? switched over to different different types oh they're, they're pretty much all being the bnm ones out of out of bow junction probably yeah cheshire would get them elsewhere uh Merrimack would get them right out of bow junction mm -hmm. yep yep i know i know a lot of the places around here did the same mm -hmm. uh, Goffstown and epping and plymouth and yeah claremont too did Cl claremont have merrimack farmers yes yep yes, Plus that, right right, right. Scott, I know you are no longer in the area, and obviously we know that um, there are some pieces of in infrastructure that can still be seen in Keene, be it the massive stone arch. Uh, I know there are a few smaller stone arches, and um, obviously the old roundhouse that's uh, redeveloped into that uh, shopping center. But any other little, I kind of come at this from sort of an archaeological perspective, any any other little tidbits that you're aware of that were sort of left behind when operations ceased? Wow, well, those are pretty much the big ones right there. Unfortunately, the freight house burned, and I'm guessing subsequently the, the mm. entire building was torn down. Uh, the biggest physical piece left that was fully visible to us is the old M and K bridge abutment out of Eastern Avenue. Mm -hmm. Mm. Western side of that that bridge is completely obliterated. Yeah, when when uh, that area was developed down where Weed Around Foods is, uh, it, it's hard to even picture the fact that the M and K came in over the Cheshire and was on the south side of the Cheshire at that point, and there was a giant fill there. That that whole fill was completely excavated out to fill the swamp land. 
Yep. Try, try and get away with that today. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> there is one crossing that I know of that still has rail in it, and that's Victoria Court, um, which must have been the beverage warehouse. Probably. Yeah. There's still north of north of north of the Cheshire and west, uh, east of Water Street, right? Yes, that would be right. Uh, just yeah. about behind Wetterah um, on the on the northern side. Um, yeah, the opposite side. There were the spur that went down in there, and there's there is a crossing that still has rail in there. So if you want to see rail in Keene, <laughs> that's where you go. Yeah. yeah Don, Donahue Beverage was at the very end of that spur. That was a well hidden operation. No, no rail fans ever went down there to take no. pictures. No, no, it's not in. The, it's not out in the open. That's for sure. Donahue was at the end, and the cars would always come in with these uh, security seals on the doors. You know, the big giant tamper-proof bar-type seals instead of little, little flimsy car seals. And uh, we put cars in there, and Capital Plumbing and Heating was on the same track. They would unload at this other small crossing just a couple hundred feet towards uh, the Cheshire. Mm -hmm. oh, that's now the Granite Group. It's still a plumbing, plumbing supply. Yep. yep. So, and I think the, I think the uh, the liquor warehouse is still a liquor warehouse, so that hasn't changed. <laughs> so, oh, there you go. Kind of funny. Scott, while you're over there working, did you have any involvement in Steamtown when it was in Keene? No. Way before my time. When I first hired out on the railroad, they uh, they also had, before we took over the Ashwila, they had sent me to North Walpole to apprentice in the shop, learning how to uh, service the Alcos, work on the Alcos, and also go out on the road to train to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, in the early 1980s, a, uh, somebody promoted to engineer at the age of 23 was unheard of. So I was right. one of the youngest engineers anywhere mm -hmm. at that point in time. One thing I'd like to touch on on the Ashley lot uh, was the use of Green Mountain Railroad's pet names for everything. Um, our uh, VP in charge of the New Hampshire Division Operations was originally from Long Island, and he worked for the Long Island Railroad. So in keeping with that, we wound up naming a lot of the uh, towns along the way, nicknames. Uh, for instance, Keene became Manhattan, um, Winchester became the Bronx, and the diner where we used to eat uh, breakfast there became Fort Apache. Uh, Ashwelot became H Harlem, Hinsdale became Brooklyn, and across the river in Brattleboro became Newark, by virtue of the fact it was on the other side of the river. Um, we had a couple of other little uh, nicknames like the crossing down at Dole Junction just before the switch. Uh, the fellow that uh, lived there had a lot of uh, fowl that would run freely across his property so he became uh, Turkey Man Crossing. In uh, Winchester heading towards Ashwelot there was a house that had all sorts of uh, cute little gnomes and windmills and flowers and things all artific artificial out the front yard. And that became Fairyland. Now, recall that I mentioned uh, Hinsdale became Brooklyn. Now, imagine our surprise one day we were going down the road in the uh, company truck uh, heading towards Brattleboro. And we're slowly making our way through downtown Hinsdale and I glanced out the window at the Hinsdale Chamber of Commerce office and there in the window was one of those big signs you used to see it on TV a couple times especially welcome back Carter the big sign says welcome to Brooklyn fourth largest city in the United States well, I can tell you we just about fell over laughing when we saw that had no idea that we had uh, 
picked the name that somebody else had also picked for, for Hinsdale. It's just one of those things. Everything on the railroad had a nickname. Every tool, every place, every person. And it was one of the fun things about uh, working for the Green Mountain on the Ashley lot. Well, thank you for coming and joining us, Scott. It was great to hear a little bit more about this, something I've always had a big interest in being, you know, somebody that spent a lot of time in Keene. And I know there's a lot of other people that have a lot of interest in this operation and, and Cheshire area history. There's a couple of, of good Cheshire railroad groups if you're interested in history. And Scott actually has a lot of photos that he took uh, from his time working on the Ashwilat branch. Um, he sells them through his uh, little production company, NMRO Productions. You can find that online. Um, he also has some sound recordings, uh, which he took, which you'll hear in this episode at some point. But Scott, thanks for coming and talking to us tonight. We hope to have you on at some point to talk about b &M history, because there's a lot of stuff you, you know. We'd like to pick your brain. So, <laughs> well, Next topic, the Pompey. Yes, we'll yeah. do the Pompey. That'd be a lot of fun. Definitely. Awesome. That, that, that's my second favorite room. Good. That's something that doesn't get covered a lot either. So that'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. 